Hey everybody, it's Bradley. Welcome back to the channel. Portland gentlemen, it's great to have you with me here today. Today's video has been a long time coming. I've actually brewed this beer two times and drank it all once and forgot about it for a while, sat on the footage and had to brew it again. Uh, it is a gold winning beer from Epidemic Ales. It is an awesome beer. So we're gonna jump into that. There'll be a full brew day following this little intro and it's gonna be good. The brew day is about seven minutes. So if you want to skip it, go ahead and skip it. And I'll be right back to go over the homebrewed Port Gentleman version versus the commercially brewed one that I picked up at their tap room. One more thing, huge, huge thanks to More Beer. More Beer helped me out with these kits. Really awesome of them to always support me no matter how long it takes me to make a video. I really appreciate that. The other cool thing is I can't go on enough about is the fact that more beer, the, the brewery also buys ingredients for more beer. I don't know about all the hops, but I do know that they definitely are using Viking malt. That's something that more beer pretty much has. So you have a gold medal winning recipe and likely the same ingredients. It just comes down to the brewer. Am I a gold medal brewer? Well, you know, practice, practice makes perfect. Let's jump right into the brew day. Research it, mash it, boil it, ferment it, drink it, analyze it, share it. Home brewing is good. All right, we are starting with the ingredients in the kit. I'm brewing two kits in this footage. It comes with all of the specialty grains, the base grains I requested not milled. You can do that at the time of purchase. There's that sweet corn, hops, and those specialty malts. One of the most important things in any brew any kind of beer is water. I always start with reverse osmosis and build up the water salts from a brew father profile. I also do the same, same thing for my sparge water. Here I am putting a lid on that Brazilla 65 liter. This time I opted to mill my own grains as I always do. Simple, easy crush on this into that big bad Glickman grain mill. Dump all the grains in this thing, choose them up, get it to my desired crush. Now it's time to mash in, dough in, whatever you want to call it, the proper terminology. Honestly, doesn't matter. The important thing is get the grains in the water with the water at the temperature you desire, accounting for the temperature of the grains. So here I am mixing. I like to recirculate up the center pipe in my brew tool system whilst I'm mixing for the most part. It just helps everything kind of mix up. Uh, that's how I've been doing it. You don't have to, or you do. There's a lot of ways to do this. Either way, I guarantee you're gonna make good beer. So here we are just getting everything mixed in. I almost forgot that corn, that's a habit I have with these specialty ingredients and whether it's my own recipe or a kit. Here it is with the water turned off. You can see how it's, it's thickened up a little bit. It's settled through. I always do a 10 minute mash rest. It definitely helps the brutal system. It also helps me find time to uh, get other stages and steps ready. Here I am dropping on that recirculation manifold. This is one of my favorite new accessories, and uh, here we are blowing off the camera lens from that grain dust. Uh, you gotta do it sometimes. All right, it is time to kick on the recirculation here in just a moment. And I usually start with a pretty vigorous flow and then dial it back. It's one of those things, you do it by feel. There's so many ways to do this, guys. As long as you're making beer, you're good. I have just inputted a timer. In this instance, this is actually some older footage. I, uh, I'm not using the recipe mode. I'm also not using the clean core valves in this one. But rest assured, as my system is today, I am definitely taking full advantage of all that new stuff. I'm CIPing the unit tank I'm going to use. This instance right here, I'm just giving it a little stir. You know, you could pull the whole thing off the top. I like to stir around it because it's it's more complex. Perhaps again, there's so many ways to do this. Just make sure you get a good stir about halfway through at a minimum, and I think that is usually adequate for most of my brewing. Here I am, kicking the pump back on it nearly full power, just making sure everything is good. Alrighty, we are at 150, and this is a halfway point where I'm mashing, just showing you. There's that wart getting nice and clear uh, after it's settled down from that stir, and it is just looking good. You can see some particulate there in the sight glass. We are trying to filter that out. Uh, some techniques I've demonstrated in older videos, you can get most of it out. Here we are pulling a sample. This is my favorite way to pull the sample uh, with this little uh, pressure release with that little uh, barb on it, it's it's just the way to go, super clean and simple. All right, it is time to sparge. Again, you see me kick on that sparge water, there it goes with the built-in pump on this guy, and here we are, sparge in progress. Again, you don't always have to sparge, 
I, I tend to like it. I've done no sparge and sparge. Uh, if you don't have time, not sparging is something you can definitely do. All right, I am boiling and I have overshot my uh, volumes by a little bit, an error on my part. These things happen. So I'm boiling for 30 minutes uh, just to try and reduce the volume down to where I want it within the vessel itself. And at this point, I have reached boil, started my timer, dumping in the necessary hops that go for the 60 minute hop edition that I did and just letting it roll. Here we are looking at that pre-boil, it was way, way too strong, and then I overcompensated. Um, again, you know, sometimes we make mistakes. So here we are, this is a decent gravity measurement. This is where I want it to be, and this is where we should have indeed wound up. All right, we're coming up on the last hop additions, just getting those chucked in the B80 Pro Steam hat. Careful not to burn yourself. Time for that uh, 10 or five minutes. Uh, World Flock tablets got to have clear beer at least to me that's important especially on a lager style all right it's time for transfer this is my transfer setup it actually works really well you know this hose creates a lot of resistance because it's pretty long but i'm happy with the speed and the rate of chilling i got a towel over the top because i had some flies bugging around in, in the brewery i didn't want to take a chance of one getting into the wart in there and spoiling my batch here we are just kind of that's the temperature i was able to chill down to this was a summertime brew at the end of the summer so groundwater was warm. This would be my final gravity where the beer ended up after all of my fussing around and messing around. Uh, that is where I want it to be. That's a good position in my opinion. Now it's time to oxygenate. I have been using this spike in it. Don't, don't mind the belly. The, the spike uh, oxygenation setup. I really, really do like it. Um, this valve and bottle system. It's just super simple. It works great every time. And these tanks last quite a while and they're affordable, it's compact, an oxygen generator is awesome, but honestly, this is convenient and cost-effective. And fermentation has begun, just letting it bubble away. Something about this is always kind of uh, hypnotic to me. I used diamond lager yeast. I don't know why I don't have footage of that, but you know, I'm Bradley, I'm a busy guy, and oftentimes, things get left out. So once I was approaching final gravity, I did switch over to the spunding valve you see there. But again, I let it go down pretty close until I was within a point or two, maybe two points. And I fermented this, I believe, at 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Here we are now, uh, spunding now. I just set it to 10 PSI. Diamond lager at this stage, it's, it's gonna be fine. You can see this on the right. I used a heat wrap to apply heat to this. Brewer's hardware jacketed, insulated tank, and that actually was quite adequate for everything I needed to heat. I found it to work really well, especially with that Kegland controller. There we are at 52, my desired temp and desired pressure. You see it hooked up to the glycol loop. Everything just working perfectly. This guy lagered for quite a while. Here we are with a, a diaphragm valve. And this is kind of a jankier valve. Uh, I have a better one now that we'll show in a future video, but diaphragm valves are the way to go if you're ever dumping a unit tank. You can totally control that mess and uh, you're not gonna have an explosion and yeast to clean off the walls. So again, I did lager this guy for about two months at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then I dropped it down to 37 or 36 for a further month while I forgot about it just because I'm Bradley. And uh, like I said, things often get missed and forgotten. There's that condensation on the tank. It still sweats. You can still get some mold. It's far better than a neoprene jacket in my opinion though. And then it was time to throw it into kegs, a simple pressure transfer with some of my favorite gear. All right, so here are the two beers. And they both, they both look, you know, similar in color. Mine is a little bit darker. And it also could be the, the glass. Uh, if I had pint glasses, I can tell you that the color in person is a little bit closer, but mine is definitely a bit darker. Could gun tend to temperature, uh, who knows what else. On the nose, they're, they're different. Obviously I'm using diamond lager yeast in this. I believe at the brewery they're using a White Labs strain. Don't quote me on that. I know more beer on the website. They do recommend some yeast. I'm a huge fan of Diamond. I find it to be predictable and uh, cost effective for what I'm doing. Now, going in for a taste. That's crispy. That's the, the commercial one, right? And here's the home brewed version. The, 
the, the flavor of both these is honestly the same. Not exactly the same, but so similar. The nose is different, but the base, the kind of the body of the beer, the hop characteristic, all that is very similar. I think it's coming down to yeast personally and um, fermentation temp and the tentativeness on the brewer, maybe the guy that made this one. Um, yeah, maybe he's, yeah, anyways, but. Mine is pretty good. Made by Sean over there at Epidemic Ales is also really good. Mine tastes a little bit sweeter to me, but ever so slightly. Excuse me, it could be mashing temp, so many things. Honestly, this is one that Sean had told me is best at about two months of maturation, he feels. This one is probably going on two months uh, in a unit tank conditioning, and then it's probably been sitting around here in a keg for at least a month. So maybe by now it's getting a little long in the tooth. I'm just not drinking beer fast enough these days. But really, if you brew this now, get the kit now in March, you're talking April, May, you're sitting on a crispy lager, depending where you are in the country. If you're in California, it's always lager time. So I really recommend it. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again in another video. Remember, home brewing is good. I've been Bradley, and I'll see you real, real soon. Ooh, ooh, it's a video. Man, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. I need to find more time for, uh, for this. But it's like riding a bike, man. If you weren't ever good at it, you're, you're never going to be good at it. Ha, ha, ha.